All right, well, good morning, Lake Point family. And uh, hey, if you got your Bibles, I need, to, need you to head to two places. Um, open up to Daniel chapter three, and then put your finger in Romans chapter one. A lot of Bible today, a lot of Bible today. And we like that, right? That's a good thing, Do we like that, a lot of Bible, okay? There's about 50% of us like a lot of Bible. I'll win the rest of you over in the next few minutes. Uh, yeah, if, while you're doing that, while you're turning to uh, Daniel 3 and Romans chapter 1, I do just want to uh, call your attention to something that was in LP News. So we've got a, a, uh, a, I think it's the first ever at all of our campuses, one night for the entire family of Point Church, our marriage night coming up on September 24th. Now, if some of you guys like popped into uh, Lake Point Men's Conference, you saw like we really pulled out all the stops to make that like a heavy investment in our dudes. Well, kind of same thing for marriage night is like, man, we know the last year, year and a half, it's been hard on marriages. We've seen that in, um, you know, requests in our counseling center and the ministry that we do. And so we're just like, man, let's invest in the marriages of Lake Point. And uh, so we're doing the same thing, pulling out all the stops, September 24th. Um, now, I do just want to give you a heads up. It's a minimal cost, $20 per couple. Um, and we are, listen, we are operating at a loss that night. This is an investment in you. Dinner and uh, we got some gifts for you. But he, here's my pitch on the $20. By the way, if you can't afford it, we'll take care of it. Here's my pitch. My pitch is that marriage night is cheaper than marriage counseling. That's it, okay? So uh, you can do that. Just text the word events. You can do that right now. Stop listening to me for 10 seconds to 20411. You can sign up there. Okay, now let me lead into week four of a series called Thriving in Babylon, where we're preaching through the book of Daniel. Title of the series, Thriving in Babylon. Subtitle, How Godly People Can Thrive in a Godless Culture. Because that's what the book of Daniel is. It's a handbook that God gave us to show the people of God across the centuries and generations when you find yourself in a culture that is godless, with godless values, and that sort of thing, it's like, hey, here's how you can not just survive, but thrive, okay? Now, um, uh, let me lead into it. So um, Jan and I, for those of you who don't know, we've got three kids, Eliana, Felicity, Hudson. Hudson's two. Um, he's our only boy. Me and Hudson, we're the minorities in a sorority. It's two against three, and uh, we're holding our own. Hudson is our master of disaster. He's always either bleeding or hurting, always. And so uh, Hudson, um, earlier this week, it was like on Tuesday, um, Hudson had like a really, really bad diaper rash, like really, really bad. And so Jana goes to change him, and uh, you can tell he's got this little fear in his eyes. He knows, man, it's gonna hurt. And so she just warns him ahead of time, Hudson, um, we're gonna need to put on butt paste. That's the life we're living right now, okay? We're gonna need to put on butt paste. And as soon as she said it, he got this real grim look on his face and he said, do what you gotta do. <laughs> do what you gotta do. <laughs> That's like a true, true story. Now, well, we're at, where we're at in Daniel, Daniel chapter three, this is a story of three dudes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you grew up in the church in the 90s, you may know them as Rack, Shack, and Benny. I was just seeing who knew what I was talking about. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, in this story, three dudes, probably in their 20s or 30s, they stare down the most powerful, violent empire in the world. And they essentially say, do what you gotta do. We are not going to forsake faithfulness to our God. Now, I wanna get right in, and I just wanna give you a quick warning. Anytime you see this, I'm actually gonna, this is probably the last time you'll see this for a while. Yeah, I'm just gonna start you guys assuming that I'm gonna speak to you in a straightforward way. This is my handy-dandy preaching helmet. If you can see it, it's like labeled, like I had them label it. Because there are some things when you preach them, they get you applauded like a hero. Everybody shares the sermons. Everybody wants to talk to you in the lobby afterwards, all that stuff. Then there are some sermons that when you preach them, they get you pounded like a nail. Um, people are, they, they don't share those sermons. They walk past you trying to not make contact in the lobby after you preach them. This is one of those messages. And so let me just say two quick things. Number one, um, I said this about the entire series, just a qu quick heads up. Later in this message, I'm gonna speak in a very straightforward way with you about um, ideology in our culture as it relates to gender, marriage, and sexuality. If you've got a young, uh, you know, maybe young years with you, a little one with you, you can just find a reason in the next five minutes to take a quick bathroom break, and Lake Point Kids Ministry is awesome. You're gonna love it. But now, let me also say this. I, I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. So will you make this confession out loud with me at all of our campuses once again? Would you repeat after me? Just say, I would rather my pastor tell me what the Bible says then tell me what I wanna hear. And all God's people said amen, okay. Now here's what we're gonna do. 
in Daniel chapter three. Pick up with me. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go pretty fast. Uh, here's, here's how this message is going to work. I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to read a little bit more, talk a little bit more, retalk, 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 and then we'll be done. It's going to be great. So here we go. Daniel chapter three, verse one. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. Most Bible commentators think it was of himself. So this, is a ni- this dude makes a 90-foot statue of himself. What that means is that Nebuchadnezzar got an A in self-esteem in elementary school. That's what that means. Hey, this is a guy who looked out at the world and went, you know what the world needs? A 90-foot me. That's what the world needs. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates. I practiced all that. And the other provincial officials. Summons all these government uh, government leaders. Now, this is also a really interesting side note. Basically, every Bible commentator says the same thing about that list. They all go, man, we know all these guys were in the government. We know all of them were, but we have absolutely no idea what they do. And to that, I want to say, welcome to government. That's what what everybody's got a title. Nobody knows knows what they do. Here we go to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, Larry, Curly, Moe, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up and they stood before it. So the entire nation stands in front, entire city stands in front of this 90 foot golden statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Oh, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the, and then it lists a bunch of instruments, the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe. So essentially, this is the demonic equivalent of a worship band. We talk about how the spirit of Babylon was behind the city of Babylon. That's what Revelation says. And so this is what they do. They gather this this worship band and all kinds of music. When you hear it, you must fall down. Every knee shall bow, was the command, and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that the King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, I wanna pause right here, and I just wanna point something out. If you are paying attention, so you got an entire nation, it's a full stadium, image set up 90 feet high, demonic equivalent of a worship band, moment of commitment, all this stuff. If you're paying attention, what you just read is the counterfeit, like a satanic counterfeit of a Billy Graham crusade. Now, I just wanna point something out to you. This is a big idea. This is a theme that runs its way through the entire Bible, and it intersects with Daniel chapter three. So I just wanna point this out. Big idea in the Bible is what always happens is whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. That's always what happens. God creates, Satan counterfeits. Satan does absolutely nothing original. God is a creator, and the only thing that Satan ever does is he takes what God has created in his goodness and he twists it and counterfeits it to try to get you to take the counterfeit instead of the real thing. He only counterfeits, nothing original. So Satan like, He eats Kroger brand cereal. He drinks Mountain Lightning. He wears a Folex watch on his wrist. He's got a Fuji purse on his arm. He wears Dolce and Banana. That's what he wears. Does absolutely nothing original. So whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. Let me give you some examples. There is the true God of heaven, and the Bible calls Satan the counterfeit, quote, God of this world. God gives the Holy Spirit. Satan counterfeits with unholy spirits the Bible calls demons. God creates revival. Satan counterfeits with riots. God raises up prophets, uh, prophets and prophecy. Satan counterfeits with false prophets and false prophecy. God calls people to repent of bad behavior and false belief. Satan counterfeits repentance with tolerance and says, no, 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 don't repent. Tolerate bad behavior and false belief. Whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits, and you need to know he is still doing this today. You know, it's really interesting. In this passage, what the spirit of Babylon moved the city of Babylon to do was set up this massive golden image to worship instead of the one true God. Guys, that is still happening today. So let me just give you some examples of this. So for instance, this right here, this is a picture of North Korea. 
massive golden image of a political leader who wishes to be worshiped as God and the people are told to bow down. Does that sound familiar? Uh, Let me do another one. This is in Turkmenistan. So this is in the Middle East. It's really close to Iraq, Turkmenistan. What this is, this is a picture of a king riding in on a horse to set up a kingdom and all the people are there to pay homage to it. So king riding in on a horse to set up a kingdom. Now, if you know your Bible, that's a copyright infringement. That's what that is. Like, that's our thing. <laughs> you know, it's like, that, that's our thing. Uh, let me do another one. This is in China. Massive golden image. Pay homage to that. Now listen, you may see all this stuff and you go, man, man, interesting. And you may ask the question, why is the same thing? Why does the same thing keep happening? Because the same spirit is still working. Times, places, and peoples change, but the spirits behind them remain the same. And whatever God creates, Satan has been counterfeiting since the beginning of time. Now, you may, you may hear all this and go, Josh, why are you saying all this? Why, why are you taking time in the message to say this? Guys, because what we are reminded here is that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, and spirits. This is why, church, we have to be strong in prayer and full of the Holy Spirit, because we are in a battle against unholy spirits. This is why it's not enough for a church simply to be strategic, professional, and excellent. Yes, we want to be all those things, but it's not enough because we need an outpouring of the Spirit and power because God can do more in a minute than man can do in 50 years with his organizing. We need that. So whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. Now, in this passage, what happens is they're all gathered and they are told, here's the, the proclamation goes out, Every knee shall bow. You're gonna bow before this idol, and if you don't, you will be cast into this this furnace, like a counterfeit hell is what was happening, okay? Now, you may hear that and you may go, okay, okay, cool, but like, that's not something happening in our culture. To that, I wanna say like, hey, you might be a little blind. And let me just say it like this. Their culture did idols, ours does ideologies, Ideologies are the idols of our culture. There are ideologies all throughout our culture that if you do not toe the line and believe and affirm every aspect of that particular ideology, well then the issue goes out, every knee shall bow, and if you won't, they will cancel you, fire you, deplatform you, and remove your books from Amazon. Daniel chapter three. Now. Because I'm a glutton for punishment, let me just speak in a very straightforward way about a couple of these that I see in our culture. Okay, one, can I just point out to you, remember, in ancient Babylon, there is no such thing as a separation of church and state. So when Nebuchadnezzar erects this massive image of himself and he says, hey, everybody bow down and pay homage to worship this image, part of what he was doing is say, hey, make your allegiance to me and this nation higher than your allegiance to your personal God. So what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were willing to be good Babylonians until being a good Babylonian meant being a bad Christian. And at that point they went, peace, we're out. We're out now. You might hear that and go, well Josh, like it's totally different now. Like we live in America, the majority of people here at the very least have been influenced by Christianity. Like that's not a thing here. Okay, let me just gently press in. A couple months ago, there was a poll that came out. It was actually a large cross-section. 150,000 people were interviewed for this poll. And they were asked this question. Which is more important to you, your religion or being an American? Now, the subset of this poll, evangelical Christians, like that's our team, evangelical Christians. Their responses to that question, 13% of them were just very straightforward. For me, being an American is more important than my religion. 13%. 13%. What that, no, I'll, just, I'll keep moving, 13%. 72% of them said, oh, those two things are of equal importance for me, leaving only 14% of them that said that their personal commitment to Jesus Christ was more important than their commitment or their identity as an American. Now, before I say what I'm about to say, let me just give a quick caveat. Like, I love America. Like, Hashtag America, like I'm that dude. 
I think it's the greatest country in the world. I got an American flag on my front porch. I thank veterans when I see them in public. I tear up every time I hear Lee Greenwood sing, proud to be an American. And when I'm watching TV and I hear people just constantly paint our nation in the worst possible light, I want to like scream, well then why does everybody wanna move here? Like I'm that guy, okay? But listen, but I will be a good American up until the point where to be a good American means I have to be a bad Christian. And at that point, I will look at any leader in the world and I will say, you can have my vote, but you cannot have my heart. That belongs to Christ and Christ alone. Him and him alone. Nobody else. I'll be really honest. Like as a pastor, I have increasing fear watching the radical politicization of our nation that's happening right now. So much so that it feels like even faithful Christians are bending the knee to ideologies on the right and on the left. And they're asking, what's the conservative way? Or what's the progressive way? Before they ask, what's the way of Jesus? What's the way of Jesus? And I would remind you, church, that our primary allegiance is not to a red elephant or a blue donkey, it's to a slain lamb. That must always, always, always be true. So number one, now number two. This is where I ought to just put this guy on. So let me remind you of something I pointed out in, uh, in the first week of the series. In Revelation 14, eight, it simply says this. It says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Keep that verse up there. What that means is that, the, now Babylon, the city had been conquered for, for at least 800 years by the time Revelation was written. What that means is that the city of Babylon was gone, but there was a spirit, a spirit of Babylon that was working behind the city of Babylon that is at work behind every nation and every culture throughout all the ages. And what that verse says is that spirit works to produce the, quote, passion of sexual immorality. This happens, in, it happened in ancient Babylon. Uh, in 1 Peter, Peter calls ancient Rome Babylon, indicating that same spirit was at work in ancient Rome. So ancient Babylon, Rome, and today in America, that sexual ideology is the same thing. It's the ideology, that it's a thread that the spirit produces in every culture that it influences. So here's all I'm gonna do right now. I'm getting ready to read you what is the most despised passage in the entire Bible. It is the most despised, hated, opposed passage of the Bible. As a pastor, I simply have a conviction that it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. There is nothing in this book that I am unwilling to read you. So all I'm gonna do, and listen, if something rises up within you in the next few minutes, and you're like, ah, I hate that, or either something in you that opposes or is angered by what I say, literally just, Pay attention, all I'm doing is reading Bible verses. Okay, so watch, Romans chapter one, I've heard it taught like this. Romans one, starting in verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people. Let me just pause and say this, very interesting to me, this passage talks about the wrath of God. In our culture, people hate it when you talk about God having wrath. That's viewed as something repressive or oppressive, something that people use to manipulate people. I just wanna point this out. For some reason in our culture, we're totally okay with us having wrath. If we see injustice out there, it's okay for us to pour out wrath. Hashtags, riot, whatever it is, it's okay for us to have wrath, but anytime somebody talks about God having wrath, oh, that's wrong, that's oppressive, that's repressive. In our culture, we are fascinated, we are totally fixated on issues of justice, and by the way, we should be. Do not mishear me. Faithful Christians should care about justice and issues of injustice. But in our culture, what we do is we go injustice, 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 and we forget that we are on the wrong side of the greatest injustice that has ever been committed. We killed God. Every person everywhere is on the wrong side of the greatest injustice in history. Now this is what it says against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who, quote, suppress the truth by their wickedness. Remember that phrase, I'm coming back. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Everybody knows this stuff about God because God's made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen. In other words, in the same way that a house reveals something about the builder or a painting reveals something about the painter, creation reveals something about the creator. All these things, the Bible says, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Now this passage says even people, watch this, even though they know the truth, that cultures influenced by ideologies, they suppress the truth. 
In other words, it's not that we don't know the truth, it's that we don't like the truth. And so we will silence anyone who speaks true things we don't like because we've already decided what we're going to do, how we're gonna live, and what we're gonna love, and what we're gonna worship. That's what you're seeing here in the book of Daniel. In other words, Babylon was saying, we want to believe that that 90-foot statue is a god. You three dudes are speaking the truth that it's not, so we will kill you. That's truth suppression. In 600, A, in 600 BC, they threw you into a furnace. In 2021 AD, they remove your books from Amazon, deplatform, or post throttle you on social media, or remove you from your job. Cancel culture is largely Romans 1 truth suppression. When an ideology becomes an idol, truth suppression has to happen. Because when you speak a truth that opposes the ideology, you are confronting the God of that nation or that world. This is why, it says they suppress the truth. This is why Amazon now removes any book that questions transgender ideology or questions affirming gender reassignment surgery even for children. This is why 95 research studies can be released that all unanimously say that the best environment for a child to be raised in is a loving household with a married mommy and a married daddy that go to church. But after 95 studies say that, maybe five will indicate, well, maybe otherwise, those five will be all over the news. You'll never hear a peep about the other 95. Truth suppression. It's why a theological lecture at a very mainstream Christian seminary two months ago entitled A Christian View of Sex was removed by, by YouTube as a, quote, content violation. Just mainstream Bible teaching about what God says about gender, marriage, and sexuality. It's why Twitter banned people during the Olympics for saying that a biological male should not compete against women in powerlifting. And it's why this sermon may be removed from our YouTube channel before you can go back and watch it again. Now, some of you, in my, especially like in my generation and down, you may hear me say some of these things or the verses I'm getting ready to read, and you may go, yeah, Josh, but everybody believes that stuff. Everybody, all the smart people say those things. No, 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 no. Everybody you've been allowed to hear says those things. And then the Bible says everyone else, they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Now, what the next verses say is that the real test of lordship in our lives ultimately usually ends up being in matters of sexuality. The Bible's getting ready to say when the wrath of God is poured out and the truth of God is suppressed, sex ends up replacing God as the new religion. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. In other words, people with tons of knowledge, super educated, but little wisdom. This right here, what it just said, this is why when somebody wants to believe something, you can always find a college professor with more degrees than Fahrenheit to affirm whatever thought or whatever ideology you want to believe. Why? Because this happens. They claimed to be wise and they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. In other words, when we stop worshiping God, listen, we don't end up worshiping bad things. We take good things and we make them ultimate things. We take good things and we make them God things. We worship and serve created things, the Bible says, rather than the creator. Now, let me get straight to the point of the next verses. We worship lots of things, but throughout centuries and generations, the things the thing that fallen human beings tend to worship the most is sex. Because why? Because when God created everything, he said it was good, but when he created the human body, he said it was very good. The apex of creation is the human body. Verse 24, therefore God gave them over. In other words, one way that God, one way that God disciplines those he loves is not by like pouring out active punishment. Sometimes the way God disciplines people he loves, you go, man, I'm actually gonna let you do what you want. Because when God says don't, he means don't hurt yourself. He loves you. And so when somebody is radically committed to running from him in disobedience, sometimes God is a loving daddy he goes, man, I'm gonna let you do your thing so that you touch the hot stove and realize that you need to come back to me. It says God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Now, 
in the next verses, starting in verse 26, I'm just gonna quote something a seminary, a seminary professor told me when I was in, in seminary. Pastors don't have to try to be controversial, they can just read Bible verses. <laughs> verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Now, really quick, some Christians love to focus only on one sexual sin. Like maybe it's like same-sex attraction or whatever it is, and go, oh, that's the really bad one. Okay, well, in this passage, the word lust is the Greek word porneia. That includes all sexual activity uh, in mind, eyes, or body outside of biblically defined marriage between a man and a woman. So what that means is if I'm reading my Bible carefully, everyone over the age of 13 is in the same category. We are all sexual sinners before God. The history of the world isn't a story of good guys and bad guys. And you may go, oh, well, that, that means you know, straight people and gay people, whatever it is. The history of the world isn't a story of good guys and bad guys. The history of the world is everybody's a bad guy, and then there's one saving good guy, and his name's Jesus. That's the only saving good guy. He's the one. Now, pick up with me. Pick up with me in the passage. Even their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. Verse 27. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations, relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, listen, you may hear that and what the Bible is, is, is forbidding. And as, like I said, especially if you're in my generation and down, you have been inundated since the day you were born by the sexual ideology of our nation. So you may hear that and you may go, yeah, Josh, objection, but people have to be able to sexually express themselves. They have to be able to do that. Let me just remind you of something. Guys, we are Christians. We worship a guy who died single and never had sex. We worship that guy. We believe the happiest, most fulfilled person that ever lived died single and abstinent. So let me just say something in a really straightforward way. You don't have to have sex. You're not doing it now. You don't do it when you go to the grocery store. Just keep doing that. You know, it's like, okay, verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they, uh, they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are, now, as I read these adjectives, this may sound familiar. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent new ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents, shocking. They have no understanding. They have no fidelity. They have no love, no mercy. Some people call this Romans 1. I call it 21st century America. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but they approve of those who practice them. They have hashtags and parades. This explains that passage right there. They not only do them, but they, they give approval. They demand approval of those who practice them. That explains why there's so much pressure today. Unless I celebrate you and support you, I'm intolerant. Unless I use your hashtag and fly your flag and participate in your month, I'm intolerant. And my point would be, if you're so insecure in your beliefs that you need my approval, maybe you should re-examine your convictions. Okay, now listen. You may hear that and go, man, let me just, again, I'm pleading with you. Like, listen, this is, we, again, it's not good guys and bad guys, it's bad guys and Jesus. I'm on the same, t we're on the same category, grounds level at the foot of the cross. But let me just say something in a really straightforward way with my Bible open. If you don't like what God says about sex and sexuality, you need to ask God to change your heart. If you don't like what God says about money and generosity, you need to ask God to change your heart. If you don't like what God says about love of neighbor and the lordship of Christ, you need to ask God to change your heart. Listen, do you know why? Because he's not changing. God's not changing. He's not changing for you. He's not changing for our culture. He's not changing for anybody. The only thing he's willing to change is you, is you. And so, yeah, if you're gonna clap, you gotta commit. You gotta go in. Now, so when this happens, this, and listen, I don't have time. This could be an entire lecture series. Ideologies that demand you bow down or else there will be consequences that pull us away from faithfulness in walking with Jesus. Now, so here's the question the that leads, the entire message leads to this question. 
So what do the people of God do when they are faced with an every knee shall bow moment? What do you do? Well, let me point out what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't do. What they didn't do is with indignant self-righteous outrage hold up a sign in the middle of Babylon that said hashtag never Nebuchadnezzar. (laughs) What they didn't do is like, you know, start a, a new trending topic, not my emperor. They didn't do that, okay? No, here's what they did. They quietly practiced respectful, faithful, gentle, but firm non-participation. Uh, Daniel 3, let me read this passage. This was the accusation against these three guys brought to Nebuchadnezzar. There are some Jews whom you, Nebuchadnezzar, have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you set up. In other words, everybody else bowed down and they wouldn't. Now, I love this so much. I almost walked out in the middle of this room and like had everybody stand up and everybody sit down and me keep standing up just so you would feel the weight of what happened with millions of people all bowing down and then three guys staring down the emperor of the nation and just refusing to bend the knee. It's like, it's so hardcore. I love it so much, okay? Now, what they did is they practiced non-participation. Um, Let me give you like a mental framework for what this can look like, okay? This is one of my favorite pictures I have ever seen. Some of you may have seen it before. This is at a Nazi rally in uh, somewhere around 1934. And I love this picture because it's like a sea of people all doing like the Sig Heil. And then one dude on the right side that's like, "Mm, nope, (laughs) I'm out. (laughs) He's just like, nope, not doing it. Now, it's really interesting. That guy, somebody tracked down this guy's story. This guy's name was August Landmesser, Nazi rally in the 1930s. Now, the, there's a backstory to this story. He was actually dating a Jewish girl. It's always the chicks. That's always what it, it's always what it is. So he essentially in this picture, he's like, you know what, Hitler, like, okay, you want this, but, but she's hot. And like, I'm not, you know, I'm not compromising that. Here's what happened, is that he and his Jewish girlfriend later separated He was eventually drafted into the military against his will and forced to serve for the Nazis on the front lines and killed. And she was eventually shipped to a concentration camp and killed there. Non-participation. Let me do another one. Um, Malcolm Gladwell made famous the story of a guy named Andre Trochme. He was a French Anabaptist pastor around the same time in the 1930s. And uh, he lived in this French village called Les Chambon. This is awesome, (laughs) this is so cool. So the Nazis sent this letter to his city saying, hey, round up all your Jews because we want to examine them and and we may need to to bring them with us. Um, This pastor, Andre Trochme, he gathered all the leaders of the city and they they were literally the only city in the world to do this. They defied the orders of the Nazis, got together and they wrote this letter. I'm gonna quote it because it's awesome. This was their letter. We have learned of the terrible scenes that took place in Paris three weeks ago when the French police, on orders of the occupying power, arrested in their homes all the Jewish families in Paris for their deportation. Fathers were torn from their families and deported to Germany. Children were torn from their mothers who shared the same fate as their fathers. We are afraid that the measures of the deportation of the Jews will soon be applied in the southern zone. We wish to let you know that we have among us a number of Jews but we make no distinction between Jews and non-Jews. He was quoting the Bible. This is contrary to the teaching of the Gospels. (laughs) This is awesome. If our comrades, whose only fault is that they belong to another religion, receive an order to be deported or even to let themselves be examined, we will disobey your orders and we will do our best to hide them among us. We have Jews, you're not getting them. That's the letter. That's awesome. Now, Andre Trochme was eventually put in jail. He made it out alive by the end of the war. Estimates are he saved somewhere around 3,500 Jewish men, women, and children. How? Non-participation. Nope. I'm out. Now, um, let me just like put on my pastoral hat for a second. In our culture, non-participation it's gonna look a little more ordinary. 
Let me give you three examples. Let's say like one night, you're out to drinks with some of your friends, like you're just out on the, you know, out on the town with some, some friends. Most of them aren't followers of Jesus. And round one comes, and then round two, and then round three, and somebody comes like, hey guys, you, re- you ready for round two? Are you ready for round three? And, uh, and you're like, you know, you're like, hey, actually, uh, no thanks. And, and they're like, oh, well, why not? You know, that kind of thing. And you just say, ah, man, actually, like I never have more than one at a time, or it's like alcohol is not my thing, whatever you say. And they say, oh, really, well, why? And you say something like, man, well, like, I'm a follower of Jesus, and like I believe that it's my calling to try to be full of the Spirit, to love and live well. And so, like, I know this may sound really weird. I just never put anything in my body that that keeps me away from being like sober-minded, so that I can be controlled by Him and just try to love and live well. Awkward moment happens. You move on. Non participation. It's a really gentle way. Nope. <laughs> um, let me do another one. Um, let's say like some guys are at work. And around water cooler or wherever, somebody makes a joke or a comment about people of another race. And you like visibly choose like not to laugh. And then somebody notices like, hey bro, you okay? Everything okay? And you might just say something really quietly like, hey man, like I'm a a person of faith. And like I deeply believe that like everybody, tribe, tongue, nation, like we're all brothers and sisters created in the image of God. And like, you just say something like, dude, I, maybe you totally didn't intend it this way, but like I know from some of my friends that sometimes it impacts them in a way that makes them feel less. And so like, man, it's just like, it's not my thing. Awkward moment happens, you move on. Nope. One more. Let's say like, again, maybe you're younger, maybe like, you're like White Rock Campus or wherever, you know? And uh, you got a conversation, you're in a relationship, you've been dating for a little while, and you have a conversation with your coworker about your relationship. Like, oh, how long have you guys been dating? You're like, oh, like, dude, we've been dating like eight or nine months. It's going really awesome. Like, we're super into each other. It's going really good. Like, oh, well, well, like, you know, are you guys sleeping together yet? Are you living together? You know, rent's really expensive. You'd save a lot of money. Dang, Californians, you know, whatever it is. They get that. That's a joke. <laughs> Let me just say, I really like you Californians. These are just jokes. But they just say that. They're like, hey, uh, you know, so how are you sleeping together? And you just say something like, oh, man, actually, like, <laughs> actually, we're not. And they're like, what? <laughs> Are you serious? Like, well, why not? And you might just gently say something like, well, like both of us like are followers of Jesus and we believe that sex is more than just physical. It's actually like the mingling of souls. That's what we believe. And so I know this sounds really weird. We're actually like waiting for our wedding night. Just gentle non-participation. Now, let me land the plan here. You need to know when this happens, what will happen to you? Uh, Check out verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. Uh, Let me get the close up here. Was filled with fury, and the expression on his face changed. He gave him the stink eye. That's what happened. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And then in verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, oh, this is so great. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. I love verse 18 so much. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. And because they were men who worshiped the giver and not the gifts. They entrusted themselves to his hand and they went, hey, whatever the Lord wills, I'm good. My eternity is secure, I'm good. So let me just say this in a really straightforward way. They worshiped him on on the even if. So our God can deliver us and even if he doesn't, we're still gonna worship him. God can cure your cancer and even if he doesn't, worship him. God can heal your marriage, and even if he doesn't, worship him. God can bring your wayward child home, but even if he doesn't, worship him. God can improve your financial condition, and even if he doesn't, worship him. Because our God can do anything, but we can't make our God do anything. He is the sovereign Lord of all. And we have been entrusted to his hands, and those are safe hands to be in. And so we can quietly and faithfully walk humbly before our God. Now, what I want to do right now 
Lake Point Church is I want to pray that God would fill us with the spirit for wisdom, strength, love, gentleness, courage to walk before him in this manner so that we could be used by him. So Father, I pray grace and fullness of the spirit on my church. Father, I do, I pray, I pray that you would pour your spirit out on our church in ever increasing measure so that it would become a felt reality in our people that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That even when we're surrounded by the spirit of Babylon, we are filled with the spirit of God. And so we can walk faithfully and humbly with you no matter what. God, we do, we worship you. We just wanna say that in light of what Jesus did at the cross, if you never did anything else for us ever again, we still have eternal reason to give you thanks. It's enough, we are grateful. And so we bend our knee to you and you only in thanks, praise, and worship, and fidelity. We pray that in the name of the crucified and risen Jesus, amen.